This video will cover carbon dioxide's effects on plants and ways you can add CO2 to your indoor garden to increase yields. CO2 stands for carbon dioxide and it is present in the air all around us. What we call air is actually a mix of oxygen and many other gases including CO2. Plants use CO2 in a process called photosynthesis so in a way they breathe. If you increase the level of CO2 in your garden, which can only be done effectively indoors, then you can more than double the rate of photosynthesis. This simply means that if you add extra CO2 to your garden, your plants will grow much faster, assuming other growing factors such as proper lighting are correct. When adding CO2 to your garden, it also allows your plants to grow at higher ambient temperatures more efficiently. What does this mean exactly? Well, if your garden is at 96 degrees, which may normally slow down plant growth in some cases, then the addition of CO2 allows the same plant to grow at a faster rate in that same higher temperature range. As human beings, we breathe out CO2, so if you believe your plant's growing faster when you sing to it, well, it does. Um, however, it's not the tone of your voice, but simply that you're blowing concentrated CO2 on your plant leaves. To consider adding CO2 to your garden, you must first understand the levels of CO2 and how they affect your plants. In ambient room air, your CO2 levels will be around 400 ppm or parts per million. This is a unit of measure CO2 meters use to give us an idea of where we are and where we need to be. When adding CO2 to your garden, you want to achieve levels of about 1200 ppm. This means you want to roughly triple the normal amount of CO2 in your air. You can test your CO2 levels with an expensive digital meter or a very low cost disposable sampling kit. Most hydroponic stores carry both styles. When it comes to adding CO2 to your garden, you have many different options at your disposal, and they all work in their own way. In the diagram above, you can see the most popular options and the main pros and cons of each choice. Generally speaking, it's usually better to go with a CO2 tank and solenoid or CO2 burner if you're growing in larger than a 20 by 20 room. The tank system requires regular refills, so you must have access to a local supplier, and the burner requires either natural gas or propane to power their units. If you're growing on a smaller scale, then your best bet is probably a CO2 boost bucket, which works very well for small to medium sized applications. The other methods work, but have more drawbacks and advantages if you have the funds for a better system. In the spirit of education, I'm going to run through some simple and more complicated CO2 systems in the next few slides. Yeast produces CO2 as it digests sugars, and an easy system can be made to produce CO2 for your garden. The main drawback with this system is that it's relatively short-lived, takes more regular maintenance, and does not produce high enough CO2 to sustain a large-scale garden. Building a yeast CO2 reactor is very easy. First, take a 5-gallon bucket and fill it 3 quarters of the way with water. Then add 6 cups of sugar and 1 tablespoon of yeast from your local grocery store. The yeast generator will create CO2 in relatively high amounts for a period of 10 to 14 days. Next, to distribute the CO2 to your garden, simply run a high-powered aquarium pump screwed to the lid of your container. Make sure the bucket is sealed with the lid on tight and drill holes for the air tubing to come through to the top of the lid. Now attach a quarter-inch hose and run it to a stake approximately six inches from the top of your plants. This chart shows that the yeast method produces a nice output of around 1300 ppm level, which when dissipated around the plant stays around 900 ppm. Once again, the main drawback of this system is that it only lasts about 14 days. If you're doing a large garden, you will need to use multiple buckets with multiple air pumps. In the long run, this can get very tedious, and the waste product produces some noxious odors. Your main waste will be alcohol, and the reason the yeast system only lasts two weeks is that the alcohol produced kills off the yeast as it builds up over time. Fungus also produces CO2 in very high amounts as it grows, and this is my preference for making a long-term, reliable, and affordable source for CO2 in a small area. CO2 Boost is the only marketed fungus-based CO2 system, but you can always make your own at home. Unlike yeast, a simple fungus bed can produce high CO2 levels for over 120 days or the majority of your indoor growing season. Building a fungus CO2 reactor is relatively simple and cheap. Simply order the Espresso Oyster Mushroom Patch from SunlightSheds.com for $25. They'll send you a bag of mushroom roots, which is called mycelium, which grow at an incredible rate on straw, old moist newspapers, or used coffee grounds. Simply take a 15 to 25 gallon tub and place a ratio of one part mycelium to two parts coffee grounds and then mix with your hands. Besides smelling like coffee, you just inoculated the used coffee grounds with mushroom roots and soon the entire batch will be completely white and covered in mycelium. 
Fungus CO2 reactor will start producing CO2 right away and you can place an air pump on top of the fungus within the tub and follow the same guidelines listed in the yeast section above to distribute the CO2 to your plants. You should have two or three one-half inch holes drilled in the bottom of the tub to allow for airflow from the room to be pulled up and across the mycelium and into your air pump within the tub. If you want to maximize CO2 production for a very large garden, keep adding used coffee grounds mixed into the existing mycelium until you fill the 25 gallon tub. You can get used coffee grounds from Starbucks for free just by asking. Also note that when you remove the lid, you want your fungus to appear moist, so if it seems dry, then add some water until you see condensation on the sides of the tub. If you see any signs of mold or disease, scrape it off with a knife and make sure you're growing in temperatures between 50 and 80 Fahrenheit. If any mushrooms pop up, just ignore them or pick and eat as they're quite tasty. Producing CO2 with an open flame can be used, but I usually recommend against it. In order to do it properly, you need to purchase a CO2 burner from a company such as CAP or Advanced Nutrients for the Hydroponic Industry. They run off of propane or natural gas usually, but refilling your propane tank frequently can get expensive. On the other side, it's usually readily available at local hardware stores. You also have trouble dealing with the extra heat and condensation produced by the units, and occasionally it's tough to find a way to properly feed the CO2 to your growing environment. They do produce huge amounts of CO2 though, but with an array of drawbacks. If cost is of no significance and you truly want to crank out CO2 and you're willing to work around the condensation and heat issue, then a burner is definitely a good option for you. A straight CO2 tank can also be purchased or rented from a local welding or restaurant supply company. They require a solenoid which can be purchased from sunlightsheds.com for about $180, which connects to an included timer and a regulator for CO2 output control. This method is the most scientific as far as controlling the exact amount of CO2 going to your plants, but refilling CO2 tanks costs about $30 and you need to refill it every week if you have a high consumption rate. You also must put this system on a timer since constant flow for more than 20 minutes will result in frozen lines from the compressed liquid CO2. Again, this is your best option for larger rooms, anything pretty much bigger than a 20 by 20. You will also notice in this chart that the PPM rating is about 10,000 PPM, which is 10 times higher than that with the fungus or yeast. The CO2 it produces will dissipate in the air and keep the CO2 levels around your plants at a truly ideal level, but at a higher cost of tank fills. When it comes to CO2, you have to consider a few things before making the plunge. First, is your crop highly valued? If the answer is no, then you have to consider the cost of adding CO2 and whether it will make financial sense versus the cost of your plant's fruit production. Second, is your growing environment conducive to it? For example, if you're growing outside, don't bother with CO2. But if you're growing inside and you're not exchanging the air rapidly, then you can afford to add CO2 usually. You'll also need to ensure your lighting system, watering system, fertilizing, and other factors are acceptable or the CO2 will not help overcome those problems. When adding CO2 to your room, typically CO2 is added by forcing it through one quarter inch tubing with an air pump or similar device. The quarter inch tubing is always placed above or near the top of your plants. This is due to CO2's properties of being heavier than the air in the room. If you place the tubing on the ground, it would cease to be as effective. Plants only utilize CO2 during the light phase of growth. In other words, you never want to have your CO2 injection system on during the dark phase as it will have no effect on the plant's growth and be in essence a waste. In closing, please realize that CO2 is not required for an indoor garden to grow properly. It simply sends your plants into overdrive if and only if all the other growing factors are met. Adding CO2 is worth doing if you're a serious grower or if you have a highly valued crop. When considering which CO2 option to choose, you need to consider the size of your grow room, your budget, access to refill supplies, and your comfort level. Either way, we hope this video helped clear up some questions and send you in the right direction. Thanks for watching.